Buenas noches, everyone. For this video, we are going to be taking a look at chapter three of Kant's Groundwork to the Metaphysics of Morals. And specifically with this video, we're going to examine the idea of autonomy or freedom and what that has to do with the way we think about this kind of ethical thinking and how it shapes our actions. Now, in order to talk about chapter three, we are going to need to talk about the end of chapter two. So for Kant, recall that in chapter two, he says that more or less every rational being gives the universal law through maxims of the will. Now, a human would write this a different way. They would say that all rational beings can write a universal law that ought to be followed by any other rational being as long as said rational being is constructing this law through the form of a moral maxim or a maxim of the will. So rational beings, therefore, ought to act as though they live in and are actively building a kingdom of ends where everybody is treated uh, and treats others as an end in and of themselves rather than a means. Now, this does seem straightforward, but what we'll find is it gets a bit more complex for Kant. Now, according to him, everything has either a price or a dignity, and those things that we treat as means to an end are categorized as a price because they can basically be replaced with something that is an equivalent. So a barista that makes you your coffee is a means to an end because within the context of an economic relationship of exchange, the barista can be replaced with another barista or a Mr. Coffee. And you can be replaced with another customer or a day off. Dignity. Dignity is another matter. For Kant, dignity is the condition under which alone something can be an end in and of itself or that it has inner worth. And nothing can have worth other than what the law determines as having worth. So if the law determines that something has worth in and of itself, that means it has dignity. And if human beings are law givers, that is, those who determine a law, then the lawgivers also have in internal worth. They have dignity. Thus, to be a being with dignity means you're a rational being, and that means that you have the ability to make rules that are moral, which is really to say that you are autonomous, which is really to say that you are free. To be free is to make rules. That well, that is what Kant thinks we are and do. Unless you think that this vision of humanity is something completely hollow or based entirely on making arbitrary rules, think about how many times in your life you encounter situations where you don't make the rules or where your ability to choose or determine the right course of action is denied to you. This is basically all of school. Kant builds on this idea in chapter 3 where he argues the following. Because morality is law for rational beings, and because freedom is that from which morality is derived, then freedom is the property of all rational beings. To be rational is to be ethical is to be free. We are, therefore, caught in something of an inescapable circle. We act as though we are free in order to act in accordance with moral laws, and we take ourselves to be subject to these laws because we have ascribed to ourselves the idea that we have freedom, or to be rational is to be ethical is to be free. But you might be saying, what if I don't want to be rational? What if I don't want to be ethical? What if I want to be, you know, bad? Well, for Kant, these questions don't make any sense because of something that scholars who have followed in Kant's footsteps have called 
the fact of reason. You are a rational being because you are the kind of being that is structured rationally. The very foundation of what it means to be a human is, for Kant, rational. Even when you are acting irrationally, you are doing so in relation to the rational construction of your person. To not be rational or not be ethical would be to not be human. And to desire those things is utterly nonsense for Kant. Because for Kant, to be human is to be rational, is to be ethical, is to be free. So what happens when people are acting unethically? What happens when they deny freedom to others or remove their ability to choose what they think is right? Well, they are denying their own humanity even as they deny the humanity of others. They are being inhumane or undignified. The weight of these terms, to be inhumane or to be humane, to be dignified or undignified, the weight of those terms is largely derived from Kant's ethics and the following of Kant's ethics throughout Western history. But here's the rub. This only applies to universalizable matters of moral law. All other elements are derivative or secondary to those actions necessary to fulfill the moral law. So, I don't know, let's think about an example. Examples are helpful. Let's take, I don't know, wearing a mask in a public setting like a grocery store or a school. Now, the most reliable available data backs the efficacy of wearing a mask along with getting vaccinated in order to prevent massive hospitalization and the likelihood of death as a result of contracting COVID-19. And there's some people who would argue that, you know, that's all fine and good, but I should be able to choose whether or not I wear a mask. I should be able to choose to be free of that constraint. And anybody who is holding me back from that is engaging in some kind of tyranny. And we might follow this impulse a little bit further along a Kantian vein and say, well, we could make a Kantian argument here that says that mask mandates essentially remove agency from people by denying them their ability to use their choice making faculty, right? Their will. Thus, it leaves them without dignity. And if human beings are going to be human, then they need to be given the opportunity to use their will, to make choices, and not have those choices removed from them. Or, if to be human is to be free, then the removal of choice is the opposite of freedom and denies the humanity of those who make such choices. Now, this is all fine and good, except for one thing. It's a hypothetical imperative. It's not categorical. And it is hypothetical because it is based on an assertion about achieving happiness. One is happier when one feels free, or one feels like one can choose to wear a mask or not wear a mask, as though it is a personal preference. And we should ask ourselves a very Kantian question. Should this apply to everybody? Or is this a means to an end? Can I universalize choosing or not choosing to wear a mask when I am out in a public place? Would we want our caregivers, our nurses, our frontline uh, medical and care support to just choose to not wear protective gear when they're surrounded by people who have definitely contracted some form of illness that is a communicable illness. I don't think that we should... We should. I think maybe there is an obligation at work. And this is where a Kantian would challenge that, that hypothetical imperative. They would challenge this assertion by saying that treating other people as ends in themselves 
requires that we have to consider the consequences of our actions uh, on others, that we have an obligation, a duty to eliminate unnecessary risks to their health. Could my actions be a way of removing the dignity of another person, such as treating them as a means to an end, or being their end? As in, like, no, not like an end in itself, like, you know, you know. If that's the case, and we wish to live in a kingdom of ends, well, then we have to think about our obligations that we have to care for others and that they have for us. We can't think that our personal freedom is an exception to the general rule that we need to concern ourselves with the general welfare of all humans in this kingdom of ends within which we live. So for Kant, to be human is to be free in the sense that we are morally free to make rules that are in conformity with the moral law. And we can create moral rules that can be universalized and applied unconditionally. Caring for others is unconditionally good. And doing, doing that which can remove harm, even at mild inconvenience to our person, is more in line with Kant's conception of obligation or duty than the possibility that uh, your unmasked face, free as it may feel, gives someone else COVID. But these kinds of decisions, these decisions about obligations, about what we should do out of duty, these are the sorts of things that Kant wants us to consider. Disregard our inclinations, our intentions, leave our feelings at the door, forget about individual virtue, and think about the very structure of what makes something moral in and of itself. We have to think about how we are obligated to others through the way that we align ourselves with the moral law. And that means we have to think about ourselves as both being writers or lawgivers and law followers. In other words, you can't, you, you can't be the person who makes the rules and then says you are the exception to the rules. The rules are the rules because they're the rules. That's, that's in one of the footnotes of the groundwork. And you have to follow them. All right. So that's basically the, the end of, of the text from Kant. It's a very truncated version. There's all kinds of nuance going on in the text that is interesting to think about if we had all the time in the world, um, but we don't. And your questions, I think, are frankly more important than talking more about the fact of reason. So we're going to jump into your questions, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer them with some amount of dignity, uh, or at the very least, some amount of thoroughness. So, with that said, let's get into questions. Question number one, did Kant grow up with religion, and did it shape his ethics or his his outlook on life? And the answer to that is yes, but it's complicated. Um, Kant wrote a book called Religion Within the Bounds of Reason Alone, in which he attempted to construct a kind of understanding of Christianity within the framework of reason as he understood it. Um, and it's a really interesting text. It's a dense text. It's con It's always going to be dense. But it's much less of a, hey, this is like what I believe about Jesus and stuff, and a lot more of a um, treatise on thinking about the constraints of our reasoning apparatus and how we cognize information and think about the world and what are the limitations of metaphysics and within that tiny, tiny little window, what, what can we see about some matter of faith? Um, Kant's background is, is in pietism, which was a, 
uh, kind of religious sensibility in the German speaking world at the time. Uh, it's a very kind of uh, person, not necessarily personal, but very private uh, kind of religious practice. It's very, very different, very different in many respects from uh, the kind of Wesleyan heritage that places like and then you might might adhere to uh so pietism is much more strongly connected i would say to lutheranism than to the methodo anglican tradition out of which uh a place like northwest nazarene would be uh birthed so with kant yeah religion but also it's it's complicated <laughs> um Another of you asked, but what about lying, though? And that's that I think is one of the one of the best questions to ask to Kant, because it's hard to argue against him on his terms. You can only really argue against what he's saying with regard to lying. If it's outside of those terms. So the common example people will use is imagine that it is the early, early 1940s in Germany and you are hiding people of Jewish descent in your attic and a member of the, of the SS knocks on the door and you open the door and they ask you, do you have any Jewish people living in your house? And how do you respond? Because if you respond in by telling the truth, you say yes. Essentially, you are issuing a death sentence. You are you are making a decision that will lead to harm to others. And it's really hard to justify saying never lie, even in that circumstance. And the way that Kant would say it, why I say it's really hard to argue with him on his terms, is he would say, so you have an inclination to protect people. And that's not a bad inclination, right? You have an inclination to, to lie, to not tell the truth in order to protect someone. And this might seem like the perfect test case for when you should do that. But, um, but in reality, is, is the decision to make an exception to telling the truth when asked a decision that you can universalize, that can be unconditional? The answer is no. If you are not going to tell the truth, no one is obligated to tell the truth. And you can't universalize that because then there would be no situation in which the truth could be possible. Even if the truth is, I am a person of Jewish descent being hunted by the SS, I need shelter, will you give me some shelter and hiding? In other words, the principle of telling the truth becomes far more important than the individual instance in which it takes place. And if you're following along with Kant's reasoning, it's hard to push back against that. But it's very easy to push back from an alternate perspective. Say, for example, what we'll talk about next week with the ethics of care, this test case about lying, especially when someone's life might be on the line, is in fact the very sort of situation that reveals the limits of a rational, rationality-based, um, ideal-based ethics. That instead, the relation that you have to others is absolutely critical to, uh, to doing what is morally right and overwhelms any adherence to 
an abstract ideal. Now, this is not to say that the the practice of abstraction is in and of itself bad. It can be a very helpful practice. But it's to say that some ideal disconnected from the particulars of a given situation is wholly insufficient as justification for why you would tell the truth and have your house raided and the people who are staying there possibly lose their life. It's not it it's not justifiable from that perspective. Whereas from a Kantian perspective, it is justifiable. On the other hand, a more charitable read of Kant would be like, there's no way that he could have foreseen the type of genocidal impulse that the Nazi regime and the SS would have. There's no way he could have fully grasped that the idea of genocide is something that's a relatively new invention and didn't exist at the time of Kant, despite the fact that Kant also was well aware that the majority of the European world was built on the colonization and uh, enslavement of peoples who were far away from him. So there's a sense in which one could argue that, oh no, he had an idea that people could be like this. So it's tricky, but uh, should you lie? No, but if you gotta lie, it better be worth it. And that worth should be protecting the dignity of other human beings. And this is a case where maybe we would say Kant presents us with a conflict of values and do we value human dignity and treating other people as an end in themselves rather than a means more than we value adherence to an abstract moral rule is there is no shortage of uh of ink spilt on this particular issue so uh it is far from settled um, next question is, how does luck relate to goodwill? How does luck relate to goodwill? Um, Kant would say that luck has nothing to do with it. There's a lot of recent literature, and when I say recent, for a discipline that's like, you know, 25 almost 3,000 years old. Recent means like the last 50 years. <laughs> um, but there's a good deal of recent literature examining the role that luck plays in our, in our morality that we can, um, we, we can benefit from being lucky rather than good. For a utilitarian, that's fine. For utilitarian, we can be lucky and not have to worry about um, not have to worry about whether or not our intentions were good or not, because the consequence of our actions ends up good. Uh, for a Kantian, luck has nothing to do with it, because acting out of duty or obligation is far more in alignment with the moral law than anything related to consequences, um, anything related to direct or indirect inclination, anything related to that which might be an external benefit. And I think that that's really important to think about because uh, for Kant, there is only conformity to the moral law. Anything outside of that is going to be superfluous or derivative. Um, that said, uh, I think one thing that that comes to mind for me, because of my weird nerd brain, whenever I think about the question of moral luck, is there's this line from uh, Captain Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, I forget the exact episode where he says, you can do everything correctly and right and still lose. And that is not injustice. That is life. 
And Kant would agree with that. There are a lot of folks who have done some good ethical writing about how, especially in Star Trek The Next Generation, the ethics of the Enterprise and of Captain Picard are fundamentally a kind of Kantian cosmopolitanism. Um, and, and I think that there is something very true about what he what he says when he says that line, that something very Kantian. It does not matter if you win or lose. It matters for Kant how you played the game. Did you treat everybody involved with dignity? Did you treat them as an end in and of themselves? Even if the moral luck you might have runs out, that's fine. That's okay, because you have acted in a way that you are supposed to act. Gonna adjust the mic here real quick. Maybe that is a little better. Oh, that's already better. Man, I hope this audio turns out good. All right. Um, Is this the last question? Yes. Okay, this is the last question. So, last question. It has been said that an arrogant person sees himself as entitled by his dignity and higher status to respect from others that they do not deserve from him. And the question asker says, I think that other people have to earn respect or do the right things to keep the respect does this make me an arrogant person and i i would say no because what what that understanding of arrogance that that is that you mention is before asking the question is not really about dignity Dignity is expecting to be treated as a person, as a human, as the type of person who is capable of being a rational being, of being uh, a law giver and law follower, right, of being free. And to be treated without that is to be treated as subhuman. And there's a sense in which expecting dignity is not arrogance at all. To expect dignity from other people just seems like the sort of thing that one should not have to really strive for. And I think that that's something that is different from ex from respect. Dignity is the base level. And respect is a kind of appreciation of the particularities of a person beyond their basic fundamental humanity. And where I think this gets really tricky is is in I'm trying to think if I have my book nearby. Uh, a thinker that I really like, a guy named Franz Fanon, writes about this in a book called Black Skin, White Masks, where he talks about this structure where there's the human and there's the non-human, and then within the non-human there is the subhuman. And, and so that which is human would be uh, a being with dignity, just like everything that Kant says about... Uh, human beings. And those who are non-human would be those who are deemed incapable of rationality. Within the history of colonization, this is typically meant indigenous folks uh, from the Americas, uh, persons who were enslaved and transported across the Atlantic to the Americas from Africa, um, colonized lands throughout the world, including like India and parts of Asia. And so the conception of 
people from these regions who were not of European descent as incapable of rationality led to them being thought of as non-human. Those from those groups who were deemed most closely aligned or closely uh, demonstrate those who demonstrated the best uh, version of of the Euro idea, the Kantian ideal of what it means to be a human, were deemed subhuman. This is within the framework that Fanon is talking about. Um, uh, Ramon Grossfogel also talks about this in um, in a video lecture he gave. Um, I believe it was at the University of Berlin. It was years ago. You can find it on YouTube. Just look up Ramon Grossfogel. But this framework complicates this idea of dignity and of respect because it points out how even the most base level, the most base level of human dignity can't even be reached by some folks within the framework that those who see themselves as human are operating. And the fault is not in, in the, in the conception of human and non-human, human, non-human, non subhuman, right? That's the way that it's framed. The, the fault is in these folks are just not capable of rationality. And even if one might not say that strongly going forward, you can see the effects of this. Um, and the effects of this kind of colonized mindset going forward. And I say all of this to say that the idea of respect being a form of arrogance is something that, that might be a kind of confusion based on that col uh, colonial framework of human, subhuman, non-human. Because there are some folks who are the descendants of or who themselves might be from colonized peoples who act in a certain way to assert their dignity, their humanity, and because for so long those who are in positions of power have viewed them as, um, as less than human, that's viewed as arrogance rather than as just straight up an assertion of one's humanity, of the base level of one's humanity. The base level. For Kant, dignity is not necessarily anything great. It's literally the bottom floor. Everything beyond this is morally praiseworthy. This is just like, what you have to do at like at the most basic level. So I say all of that to complicate um I think what's a very fair everyday question because I think that it touches on some of the some of the issues that thinkers like Fanon really really illuminate for us that this idea of a universal rational being is not really that universal. It's, you know, like an Anglo-European being who adheres to the linguistic and epistemological conventions of uh, Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment rationality. You know, it's not somebody from Martinique or from Puerto Rico or something like that. Because uh, the peoples of those lands are not viewed within that framework as human. Now, Fanon is not highlighting this framework. Grossfogel is not highlighting this framework. I am not highlighting this framework as an advocate that it is good. Rather, I'm saying it's an explanatory device that helps us understand how, in some cases where somebody might think, oh, you have to earn my respect... 
and or oh you are being arrogant no that is a person who comes from an historically excluded and historically marginalized group asserting their basic humanity and it being seen as this radical action and for all of the problems that we might have with Kant, I think one of the best things that he gives us to think about is how dignity and all that dignity entails is the base level of an ethics. Now, whether or not that rings true in contemporary settings, we'll find out next week when we talk about the ethics of care. But in the meantime, Thank you for watching and for doing the reading, and I will see you later. Adios.